Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our AGA talk, and thank you so much for coming. I'm particularly aware that it's a lovely sunny evening outside, so well done you. Um, I'd like to welcome Bill Price of WSP, who's come here to talk to us. Our talks are intended to stimulate an interest and a discussion in our built environment. So not just architecture and buildings, but streets, squares and places, and what makes them healthy, successful and happy. I first met Bill around 1989, when we were working on the first Brit school in Croydon, South London. It was a pretty crazy design, the whole roof suspended from giant steel trusses with, um, how many? 163. And you'd remember that. 163 penetrations through the waterproof roof membrane, <laughs> which was a bit of a worry. But I recently saw the Netflix doc documentary on Adele, who, went, who studied there, and the building's still standing. More seriously, Bill's now part of the WSP UK growth team with responsibilities across property and advisory services. He typically works at the age, uh, early conceptual stages of major projects, where buildings and infrastructure combine to generate property, placemaking, and social value. Uh, and tonight, Bill's going to be talking about how investing in public realm or placemaking helps to make people's lives better. We've got a new island plan that, for the first time, puts placemaking high on the agenda. We also have a housing crisis, need a new hospital, have, a, have waterfront plans for nearly 1,000 homes, and an emerging harbour master plan. So Bill's topic couldn't be more relevant. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, well, uh, it's extremely nice to be here. Um, I came this morning. Mike gave me a little uh, tour of uh, the uh, part, some parts of the island. But I have been here before because we've, we've done... Uh, work in the past, perhaps been three, four, five, six times in the past, and it is uh, nice to be back. And of course, I, even I have seen some uh, some changes. So let's uh, have a look. So these are the uh, six things I'm going to uh, talk to you about. As a little bit of scene setting, I'm going to talk about some um, work we did in, in association with rail, um, but it's a little reference to data, um, and it's really about um, global interest in city density and I know this is not a city it's a town um, but I think throughout this there are some parallels and um, you know so, some things that I, I think are relevant to it everywhere that people are um, then uh, I'm going to got these three examples of, of case studies um, of uh, these are big uh, projects in London which do this thing of combining property with infrastructure um, and I think some social value. So I'll explain what, why, why those are there and how they uh, function. Uh, we're also, we won a job last year to rebuild the can, the Quasette in Cannes. If anybody's been to MIPIM, you'll remember what that's all about. Um, and this is, this is interesting because of, partly because of your own situation here. And then I'm a, a trustee of the Royal Society of Sculptors. Um, I'm also, uh, trustee of the Rose Theatre in Kingston. Um, but the Royal Society of Sculptors means I have an involvement with public art, uh, which I, I'll show you some of, and which I think is a very uh, useful uh, addition to, to the public realm. And then I've got a few little conclusions to draw. So let's have a look at this, um, <clears throat> just this data, data situation. Um, this is a map of London. And all the black sort of snakes are uh, either tube lines or rail lines. And we measured all the uh, track area, the land area owned by Network Rail and TfL, um, where it wasn't in a station, not in a tunnel, and not under a bridge. This is big data for you. We measured that area. Um, we worked out that we, we thought we could get about a quarter of a million homes on 10% of that land. Now, at that time, London was saying it wanted 50,000 homes a year. So this suddenly became quite interesting. And I was once in a, a presentation a bit like this, and a developer at the end of it said, yeah, that's all very well, Bill, but where is that land? So we then expanded this uh, survey um, uh, or, or methodology to look at 
things that would affect the ability to build homes. Uh, so there were these 10 items and another 10, including opportunity areas. Mike mentioned some of your opportunity areas earlier, which would influence <coughs> where these things would be encouraged. And then I was able to drill down through this data into, for every borough in London, into the spots in this particular bit of barking, the bit that best fits those criteria is that blue bit up there, and the purple bit is the next bit. And we still ended up with, I think, actually a few more homes, 290,000 homes. Um, and then this all got picked up across, uh, I suppose, the globe. And uh, we have done this study for all these places. And I think it, it, it reflects this desire to, to have density in cities and provide homes and to somehow find land. And of course, the rail land is um, usually very difficult to work with, probably expensive. Um, but you don't have to buy it of someone that doesn't really need to sell it to you. And that's, that's, the, that, that's the point of it. And so that, that is that list. It turns out that Paris, uh, th th actually, th this is down to um, a 10 kilometer radius rather than, London is really a 20 kilometer radius place. Uh, but some of these places get a bit small. So we, we use 10 for this. Um, and this is a 12 story building. Um, so there's even more land available in Paris than there is in London. Um, uh, but we looked at all those cities. Um, America is interesting because America did this thing really where they, they seemed to move straight from the horse to the car. They didn't really bother with railways. Um, I'm just thinking about it, that might be what you did, <laughs> actually. I mean, I know you did have a railway, uh, but you haven't really had it since 1929. Uh, I, I don't think. Anyway, um, that's the uh, that that's a little bit of backdrop to what what's what global cities and towns seem to be wanting or thinking. So let's just uh, move on to these um, case studies, and I'll say something about these three jobs, uh, which I was very involved with. So um, the Shard in, in London, then Paddington Square, which is nearly finished, and Liverpool Street. Now, these, these projects are actually uh, all uh, run, um, development manager clients for us is seller property. Um, and it's been this long journey for me personally, uh, as, as well as them. Um, the architect on the first two is Renzo Piano and on Liverpool Street is Herzog and de Meuron. Um, at one time, I don't know, Mike might remember this, but in two, the year 2000, WSP in London was not a particularly uh, well-known or strong company for high-rise buildings. But we did acquire two businesses in America and uh, I was quite instrumental in trying to join their skills onto our London skills to make us credible. And in 2004, we won uh, the commission to be the structural engineer for the Shard uh, and some other things, transport, uh, acoustics, geotechnics, fire, uh, uh, and so on. Now, uh, at one time, I used to talk a lot about special things about high rise. Um, and at one time on, on the internet, if you put my name into, into the internet and with the Shard, it would say not only Bill Price designed the shard, but he also built it as well. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> neither of them, I mean, uh, I did, honestly, I didn't really promote that. You know, that wasn't my idea. Um, but what I did do in about 2002, 3, 4 was work out how to win it. And that was about how to join our US and Hong Kong engineering skills onto our London knowledge of working with European architects. <coughs> and if I, if I take any credit, it, it's, it's for that, that aspect. And then really, that, I have stuck quite close to that client uh, for all, all these years. Um, so if we just have a, a look at the, sh at, at the Shard, uh, there's a variety of images here. A very, there's not really anything to do with the building. It's all to do with the stuff around it. So um, the red spot is where the Shard is. 
sort of immediately south of the city, um, West, West End. Uh, St. Paul's is very important because the, um, the Shard is in the background view of St. Paul's from Primrose Hill. And in 2004, it got planning permission because Prescott decided that it was sufficiently far away that it was respectful of the dome of St. Paul's. Clearly, some people didn't agree, but that, that was the end of the line. They got planning permission and then uh, they, they built it. it. It is worth perhaps adding that it did take three years to find someone with a billion quid to pay for it, and that was Qatar. So that's ha how that uh, came, to, came to pass. Actually, another interesting thing about these projects is they do take a huge amount of time. So if you think the client here, seller, Irvine Seller, bought the site in 1999, let's say 2000. The building was topped out just before the Olympics in 2012. And then it took really another three years to fit it out. So that, that's a 15 year chunk out of you know, my life, my career to, to do that, that building. These things, big buildings, take a long time to get lined up and organized and a long time to deliver. And that has a roll on effect on the public realm and everything that surrounds it. I'll, and I'll show you a bit about that. So this is a bit closer up. You can see how the tracks are going through London Bridge Station are there. Southwark Cathedral mark there. And this is a very early Renzo Piano sketch of the tower. And I, I, I really like this because even on this thing, which is about the building, the build, it, this it didn't really get built like this at all. But you can see he's showing over here the tube lines and then over there, Southwark Cathedral. And I think that's a very... It's a very nice thing to show it in that, in that context at that stage. That's a very old drawing. And this is another drawing. And this is of the, the news building, which is next to the Shard, um, with the bus station tucked underneath it. And this was an old, old idea to combine the bus station and the kind of public transport on, you know, well inside the red line, causing the engineer to cantilever 18 meters over the bus station. Um, but that's, that's, you know, that's what we did. This is, if anybody remembers London Bridge, this was the old, the old site of um, the tower that they bought. That's, this is where the bus station used to be. And really the, the public realm benefits of the Shard were all about moving the bus station and building the upper part of the new roof over London Bridge Station. And so, oh, and the green and the blue here, the blue is the original uh, through tracks, that, if anybody knows London Bridge, that go to uh, Cannon Street and uh, Waterloo East and Charing Cross. The green stuff is new tracks, with new through tracks. I'll come back to that in a minute. So there's massive rail changes here, public transport rail changes. This is the footprint now of the news building. And then eventually you can see the, the bus. This is another Renzo, classic Renzo yellow. Uh, the bus stations moved around here. Um, and this is the core of the news building. And then, but the building all leans over to here and co covers this whole uh, area. Uh, something else uh, that you can, you can see one of the reasons it also cantilevers is because underneath it is the ticket hall for the Jubilee line. So actually, we couldn't put any columns through there anyway. This is the this down here. This is the core of the shard, and now we have just finished redeveloping that whole site as well. So in about I don't know uh, this year, that will all open up and, and, and liven up as well. So the the kind of collateral development with the shard was all this roof over the station, which got finished when the, the station was rebuilt. Um, and then all the public realm around here, which is all maintained by uh, the Shard Management Company. So all that granite, all that security, all that 24 hour people hanging around, making sure that it's safe is courtesy of the Shard. This, is, this should be a photograph because I have actually built it. But this is a CGI of, the, of that bus station in the corner of the Shard. 
and this, I would say this is another thing that came out of that. The linkage into the Jubilee line was uh, often overcrowded and worked very well. So the part of the deal became building this new uh, connection here. And this was, we were able to surround that with retail, but that whole link, we call that the Joiner Street link, was another aspect of, if you like, pedestrian desire lines, um, pedestrian flow, and so on. And this is the kind of evidence, part of the pedestrian flow modeling, the evidence that demonstrated that this was a, a worthwhile, valuable thing to do. Um, so, so this is another, if you like, public benefit associated with that building. I, I thought I'd put this in for sort of uh, amusement value. This is the news building. Uh, and this is the extent of below ground infrastructure that this building has to cope with. This is the Jubilee line. These are shafts, air shafts, vents, sewers. Um, uh, and this is, this is, these are the raking columns to enable the cantilever to happen. So these are, to achieve this uh, sort of level of social improvement, there's some very interesting engineering uh, required to, to clear, clear that, 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 that place. I can say a couple of things about the station. Some of you might remember what a terrible, gritty station it was. This is the old, the old uh, Victorian roof, not, not listed, uh, not really very good. Nothing like, um, nothing like uh, Paddington or St Pancras. This is a plan on the rebuilt station. I mean, there's, there's remnants of lovely heritage here. So I'll say a few things about heritage uh, later, but th these, th this strip, this strip running through here, uh, the, some of which is now gone. This was the original first railway into London from Gillingham. And then you can see, and I think most stations, this in London that happened, the station gradually grew as more and more tracks. Uh, got added with, with density. And this is just a little comparison of what happened now. The sort of in parallel, but a bit later than the shard. So this is the shard core here. Um, this is how the station used to be with nine terminating tracks and six through tracks. And over a five year period, and this just happened to be a WSP job as well, it got changed to this. So there's now six terminating and nine through tracks. So this is all about increasing train capacity, um, improving public transport, reasons to not drive a car into London. Um, and that, that is a very successful uh, job. The architect for that was, was Grimshaw and it, it's a very attractive station. So that's what it uh, looks like now, new, new station down there. Okay, so there's a few, there's a few ideas there. Oh yeah, that's, that's inside the, the concourse. So that's the Renzo roof associated with the shard. So the, these are shard columns, um, with the, the building in the background. I'm now gonna talk about Paddington Square for a few minutes. So this is kind of uh, Renzo's follow-up to the shard at Paddington. This is a view, it really nearly looks like that. Um, this is a first floor office reception, all this public realm, come back to that. Um, 400,000 feet of offices, uh, 70,000 feet of retail. Um, and these are um, the pair of lifts that go up to two, well, a level and a half of restaurants on the top, all public access. Um, I mean, obviously you need to book, but uh, it's not, it's not a private club or anything of the sort. It, it, it's a bit like aqua at the Shard. So if any of you know Paddington, this is probably, well, this is Brunel's most fantastic station. Uh, Brunel uh, in the 1870s built, designed, built spans one, two, and three, and then span four with this funny pointy snouty end was added in about 1928. Uh, the site, is this red box and on that site was a building uh, which was the Royal Mail Group building, post office kind of thing, it wasn't the post office, it was a kind of where post came in. And um, 
actually, so there are tunnels, mini tunnels, small diameter tunnels underneath this site that we had to deal with. This was a fun thing uh, called the Mint Wing, and this is what's known as a horse hotel. So at one time, post would come in, mail would come into Paddington Station, and then uh, horses would move that mail around London. And the horses, the, that, there's one here, and there's another one there. The ramps for horses to go up to the stables were on the first and second floor. That, <laughs> oh dear, that's, um, I mean, the rest of this stuff at the back is St Mary's Hospital. And if you can believe it, this is one of St Mary's Hospital's NHS buildings now in the horse hotel. Um, that is that is the state of um, um, you know some of our hospitals. You complained about not having a hospital here or not making it happen. They that hasn't happened for thirty years as well. That that is in dire need of uh, improvement. This is the only tra full trauma hospital in London. There are four trauma hospitals in London. This is the only one that doesn't have the ability to land a helicopter on, on it or next to it. Um, so that's our Paddington site. Uh, this is a, another lovely Renzo drawing. Uh, uh, and this is the kind of plan. So the station's up there. This is our cube, the, the office. And in these, when Mike said at the, I get involved at the very early stages, what I worked out here is I, I thought it would be great if you came down Parade Street, which is not like great. It is great if you want a kebab or a postcard or an umbrella. Um, but if you were on there, what you want to what you want to be able to do is to go into the station over there. So you can now come down these escalators and through the mall at concourse level um, and cut that corner off. And so you have a you know, as a as a kind of member of the travelling public, you have a, uh, a much improved journey. Uh, the, you, you, there's a much simpler access from the back. Uh, there's a set of escalators down there. And then the tube station, the concourse for the Bakerloo line was very small. And so I thought it would be much better to make it a lot bigger and also crucially give it step-free access. So for many stations in London, uh, they don't have step-free access for the disability, for families, uh, and um, for people with bags. So I feel very proud that uh, I've kind of dreamt up a scheme. It, honestly, if you'd said to me, you know, five, six, seven years ago, would this ever happen? I probably might have said, I don't think so. It's too hard. But we have done it, and it's fantastic. Lorenzo gets to put colour it in yellow and put some black dots on. Uh, and I get to deal with all that. Uh, so th these are these Royal Mail tunnels, little little tunnels. This is the Bakerloo line. Um, the new ticket hall uh, fits in here, step-free access, obviously, between the tunnels. And this is this old stuff underneath the raft. I must admit, there is a point where I'm very grateful of the amazing engineers within WSP because I kind of, you know, I kind of move it over to them and they somehow work out actually how to do it. Um, so this is the completed kind of idea, the cube, uh, the red lines are uh, vehicle movements. And one of the things I could, might conclude is that the, these things I think require us to be bold about do, <coughs> doing, doing stuff because um, if you look at this, this is a road. This is a road going down to the station. This is a road, uh, London Street, that used to be the ambulance road here. And we realized that to improve this space, we need to get rid of that road, just remove it. So that road has been moved from there to here. And then that road has been completely taken out. And you can imagine two roads in the middle of London full of sewers, electricity, gas, water, fiber, that's all been relocated and removed. It's quite a, um, expensive, but uh, quite an ingredient of creating some of these spaces. So let's 
So that that's the idea, the purple being the sort of walkways and pub public access permeability, if you like. Uh, so this is what the old, I don't know if anybody remembers this, this is the old arrivals road down to the snout on span four. This was the entrance to the Bakerloo line, retaining wall here. So what used to happen in the rush hour was that um, too many people arrived at, at the station to get up the two escalators that existed and they could not, people used to queue on, they used to hold people on the street so that they could not get into the station and go down the escalator and then burst people off the platforms onto the track. You, can, you know, this is, this is, you know, just completely not okay. That's, this is the building at the back that we demolished. I'm sorry if you like the look of that, but it did go. I'm not sure that would, today <coughs> it would be so easy to argue to get rid of that building. That's an old other talk, maybe. Um, so so that, is not, that is not a way into the station anymore. So that view becomes this. Uh, so that, this is the Garfunkel's in the hotel, which is not part of the scheme. And this is it at the front. It's gently slopes down to the uh, to the station, like four times bigger. Uh, and then that's the front of the. Uh, actually, this this reminded me of, you know, we sometimes talk about livening up towns. Wouldn't be good if there was more activity and stuff was going on. Do you remember during COVID, how with a, a pot of yellow paint and uh, by putting chairs outside restaurants and cafes, suddenly the streets look like this, even in winter. You know, it, it, that was a very low cost way of creating life in a, in a town. And it certainly happened in, in London. And then this is the other view. Um, this is a sort of smoker's alley arrangement. Uh, and that, that bec has become like this. So my desire line is to come out of the station um, and straight through there, and then you can get to Parade Street at the other end. Uh, and it, it sort of pretty much looks like that. There is a hoarding up here at the moment. And I just put the trees are about to arrive. Not sure they're that big or that green, but they won't be, they won't, knowing Renzo, they won't be far off. And that's the, the front. Okay, so um, I've got to say a bit about Liverpool Street now. And there's some different, uh, I think there's some different issues here. Uh, this is where it sits in the, in the city. Um, this is uh, Central Line. This is Circle and Hammersmith City. This purple one cutting the, off the corner of this red box is the new Elizabeth Line. Um, and the, the, this is the main line, uh, Liverpool Street tracks running out to places like Ipswich and uh, Stansted and so on. Uh, this is, uh, you know, Broad, Broadgate, Bishopsgate. This is, this is like skyscraper, city, gherkin, uh, and so on. Um, now, I put these in, if you, if you don't know the station, but this is what it is now. So here's, here's this, uh, the existing Andas Hotel, which is very impermeable. The station ha has these little bridge decks at street level. Uh, and then this, this is where you drop down. Interestingly, Liverpool Street is the only station in London where the tracks are below the street. Uh, every other station, they're either at street level or they're on, on viaducts and arches. So if you think of the opposite might be Waterloo, where it's all up in the sky as opposed to the other way. So you have to drop down. And the, the whole idea of, of this, knowing that network rail were uh, uh, running out of capacity at, at the station, um, congested, uh, you know, when we, when we do the mathematics and the pedestrian flow modeling, we have to look at uh, the year 2041 and then plus 35 percent. So that's the that's the kind of timescales of planning of of 
uh, transport infrastructure of this nature. And so this becomes this. So really, at street level, it, it becomes a, a deck all the way through. Um, there are these openings with escalators to get you down and, and lifts to get you down. And then the lower level um, um, becomes, becomes like that. We move the gate line because at the moment the, the gate line is back here. People get off trains and they queue to get through the gate line and there isn't enough space. So they're then queuing back up the platforms and this is unsafe. And those, those platforms are not uh, really wide, wide enough. There's nothing, it's very, very, very hard to do anything about that. So that's the, uh, the kind of big idea. Um, and then a few other things. At the moment, that station has uh, two lifts that only get you from the, that street level down to the concourse level and not to the tube infrastructure. So this is the uh, uh, central line. Um, uh, this is actually the route, if you, you might have done, has any, have you been on this, have you been on the um, Elizabeth line? Anybody been on that? The Elizabeth line is completely fantastic. It is worth, if you if, if and when you're next in London, have, take take a trip on it regardless because it, it I you know it is incredible. Even I, as a London taxpayer, didn't don't mind that it cost an extra four billion quid and was three years late. You know, it was worth it. Um, so in terms of step-free access, it goes to this, and by far the most expensive and difficult thing to do is this, which is to put step-free into the central line, which has not. Uh, ever existed um, but I, I think for a main you know Liverpool Street is there are four big stations in London two north of the river two south the two north big ones north are Victoria and here and the two big ones south are Waterloo and London Bridge um, and it's very amazing that one of its key connections doesn't have step-free access uh, and we're, so like the Bakerloo at Paddington I, I really hope we can we can do that and make it better for, uh, for everybody. This is some of the early thinking about public realm and about uh, connectivity. So the, dif the difference is that this is much, a much bigger piece of transition space. We're going to open up the ballroom so you'll be able to walk through that instead of it being a private part of the hotel. Um, the carriage drive, which used to be where taxis went a long time ago, is going to be reopened up. And so the, I think, it, I mean, I know I'm biased, but the, I think the heritage of the hotel is going to be respected and enhanced um, uh, it, in, this, in this process. Um, it's got a bit, a bit difficult to work this out, but basically the, this whole area becomes a bit like a, a street, a bit of a transition area from, from uh, compared to, to what it is now. This is uh, space syntax work on uh, uh, pedestrian desire lines and movement, trying to demonstrate where people are trying to go to, to, to be active in, in the city. Now, uh, to achieve all that, um, unfortunately, you need me again, um, because this, here's the Elizabeth line. This yellow stuff is the Royal Mail, the little, little tunnels, and then there's a the central line. So here we have a 27 metre cantilever, Mike, um, of uh, a 14 storey office building um, in order to go over the central line and, you know, without any columns. So what we have is, is a kind of a, a, a network of mega columns to hold up this gigantic building. And then the hotel I mentioned a minute ago that was here or is here and is being retained, the new hotel goes on the roof. Now, I think there's something really innovative about what's been done here because the, the developer, this is the funder investor for this is MTR Hong Kong, and they are actually the operators of the Elizabeth line. That that's a, a, a sort of that wasn't fundamental to their involvement, but it helps. 
a lot. Um, basically, the developer has come to an arrangement with Hyatt, who uh, own this hotel, um, and they said, if we, can, if we give you a new hotel, will you let us take your hotel into our scheme to provide this office building, which, by the way, will completely rebuild and transform the station. So the developer and MTR don't own, never did own anything here. What they've got is an arrangement with an owner with adjacency. And I think this is, a, this is uh, really relevant to that rail overbuild story. Uh, adjacency and proximity to a site is a, is a way to become what is known as a special purchaser, to have a relationship to, um, to be able to negotiate. But honestly, you know, how many, how many developers do you know would do this? You know, this is, this is tr heroic, amazing uh, kind of engineering and collaboration over many, many disciplines and so on to achieve, to achieve this. But I, I, th I think, and I am biased, I think those benefits for us when we are traveling in that part of town or around the Shard or Paddington are tangible. They are, they're, they're real things. The city wants density. It wants AAA quality office space. And it, it's, uh, you know, those organizations, Network Rail, TFL, they are not overflowing with money. They wouldn't be finding this an easy process. So a few more images of, of what we're going to be doing. The lower stuff is all the station infrastructure, quite a busy slide. And then this is what it should look like. These images are all from the planning application that was lodged two weeks ago. Um, so this is the building. Uh, and this is the hotel on the top. This is a public garden, publicly accessible from ground level, free. There's a public swimming pool up on that roof. Um, again, you know, bringing things to the city that none of none of these none of these other buildings, uh, you know, Heron Tower, uh, 140, uh, the 22 Bishop's Gate is here. They do not. They do not provide the same level of, um, you know, public accessibility, I, I feel. There's a, there's a kind of generosity uh, in, in buildings. I, I, I think if buildings can be more like that, it's better for our, for our cities overall. This is from the street level. You just see the garden. Hopefully the trees will be that big, but it will take me a while to do all that work. This is inside the station. The gate line pushed back. The gate the number of gates is increased by maybe fifty percent. Um, you can see the mega columns. See the back of the hotel retained. Actually, you can see on here this bus. There's a bus station here. So I feel this is what we might call a integrated transport hub. You know, bus, taxi, bikes, trains, uh, tubes all made much easier for, for us to use. These are these big openings through the upper, the new upper concourse slab. Anyway, we'll see what the, uh, see what the planners make of that. They know, as you can imagine, they know a lot about it already. So uh, that's, that's the Liverpool Street Station uh, project. Um, I'm just going to mention this now because uh, last year we won uh, the job to remodel the Croisette at Cannes. Uh, this pink area is, the, is what's going to be done. Um, this, this space from, from right here to there is about one kilometer. So if you think of your, your bay here, it's about three kilometers. So this is only a third of the size of your, your big bay right here. Um, uh, the, I, I, there's a lot of people involved in this, but the pe people that are mostly, I think, worked on the competition entry were Snow Hetter, which is the architect from Norway, and, and us, and us with our French office. Um, and if I just show you, there's a very nice, well, 
There's an idea, this was in the competition entry, talking about curvature. This idea of the pearls in the necklace was about uh, little places along the roots of that curve that you could do stuff and things happened. Um, and then they, I don't, to be honest, I don't really get this pointillism thing. It was in the, you know, it must have impressed somebody, but um, I don't know if those little points were the points on the necklace, for example. Um, however, I think this is a really, this is, this is an image of what the Corsettis hoped to become. So, uh, you know, if you've been there, there's like a dual carriageway basically runs all the way around, gray, black, tarmac, it's all rather, the, the, the edge, the sea part is, is quite elegant and wide, but then it turns into a motorway and it's hard to get across. So the idea is that all the surfacing is, is harmonized across the whole piece and the traffic is calmed. There's a proper cycleway and an and inboard, this is a, a kind of inboard walkway. So you, there's a place to walk as well as a place to sort of exist on the promenade as it were. But I think these these five points here, I think are very nice uh, words. These are words from the competition. Art and cultures are levers of activity and programming. And I think in if you applied that to London, I think art and culture need to be more associated with creativity, even within <coughs> what happens here, of course, which is your um, uh, banking, finance, legal, accountancy, management consultancy, professions. In other words, uh, there is creativity in, in all those businesses as well. Uh, and I don't think that link is, is strong enough. Structure of mobility and new destinations providing closure and purpose. So that's the thing about the 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 uh, kind of ideas on the on the on the necklace. We don't quite have a Mediterranean landscape in even here, but um, they've they've talked about misted and shaded urban living rooms. But urban living rooms is a nice uh, thought. Here's this thing about heritage, highlighting local heritage by changing the relationship with water and light. And, you know, in, in their amazing seafront, as in yours here, there are these fantastic buildings and uh, pieces of history and, and things that could be enhanced. Um, and then part of this is uh, unique street furniture and sort of the brand of, of the town. And I think they, they anyway, the judges must have liked it because uh, we, we were very happily successful. Um, so this uh, is what it looks like now. Um, here's one side of the motorway. Uh, here's a load of plant pots. Um, uh, you know, clutter, not very great. And the idea is that, you know, the road becomes uh, connected to the cycleway. This is an idea of one of these sort of signature pieces of um, uh, street furniture, uh, you know, decluttered, new lampposts, everything thought about properly. Uh, this red, red surface um, goes all the way across from one side to the other. There's an, another view. This is, I think this is one of these little uh, one of these little spots. This is a, um, a sort of theater performance kind of gathering type spot. There's another view of that, uh, some of that furniture. Uh, I, so this is the very far end. I don't know if you've been there, there's a skate park, famous skate park at the far end, and it, that, that's just over there. Um, but th this, is, this right now, this is a you know, black motorway um, and it's all been re-landscaped and planted and, um, you, you know, made, made into a, the whole thing seen as one, one entity. So um, I'm just going to finish off by showing uh, five items of sculpture and art in the public realm, which uh, in, in my connectivity with the RSS, but WSP for 25 years has been 
a kind of oily rag for artists and sculptors, things that want to fall over or snap or, um, you know, need, you know, need painting and protecting and fixing. So um, there's a few, a few things here. Um, uh, th those are the, the five items. So this was in um, uh, Grosvenor Estates had this, this is, it was a temporary thing, but this existed and it had sound associated with it in a very elegant part, not far from Selfridges, sort of Mayfair, uh, which we helped to do the installation with. But, you know, I think this was a, this was a, um, a thing that people recognized. I wanted to be, you know, people met there, they talked there, that there was a cafe at the other end. So that's, that's one of them. This is, this is um, uh, a piece of sculpture procured through the RSS. Uh, Tom Moore did this, it sits on this stone plane. This is on a persimmon housing estate in uh, Harrow. Um, and we, we supported Tom in, uh, in doing, doing this and uh, making sure it didn't blow over and snap off. And we're now doing another piece actually with persimmon uh, at Chinor um, on another housing plot. But I find that quite refreshing that, you know, they don't have to do that. Um, and they don't have to procure it in, a, in such a relatively complicated way. Um, this is uh, Temple Roof Garden. Um, so this is the roof of Temple Tube Station, which is Westminster City Council have allowed to become a sculpture park. This was the first item, this colorful thing here. There's now a really, uh, where that is, this is, uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is a shocking photograph. I should have, but there's a not very colorful sort of shed here now, which matches those colors. And that's like the base. And Westminster are very comfortable that this is a kind of rotating, it's curated, um, it's funded, and it's a place you can, you, anybody can walk up here during the day, shut up, locked at night. Um, but during the day, you can have your sandwiches up there. It's a very, it's a place. We, we've helped to create a place. I mean, that's a very nice uh, thing. This is Polly Morgan at Royal Society of Sculptors. Uh, this is outside, this is in Old Brompton Road. This is a kind of, this is concrete. This is a kind of, this was a snake, which has been, had a coiled up a real snake with a cast of it, and then Polly has basically painted every scale of the snake um, up close. This is a slightly a slightly visceral, frightening thing. And you know, th it, it, is this piece of concrete trying to fall onto this one? Is this in is the snake in compression, or is it sort of somehow in tension? It's a very it's that kind of thought-provoking stuff that I enjoy and I think you know I know people in our office enjoy it um, working with an artist in this way and then finally uh, this is Jean Plenza a really big uh, artist um, in Barcelona and this is a piece that goes outside the shard this is I think this is his maquette um, these are all it's basically a a collage of uh, stainless steel all welded together. And these, these were some of the elements. Um, this is his workshop, putting the stainless shapes onto the, um, the forms. Um, and it's all welded in ground, ground flush, but there's a, there's a huge amount of engineering in this. This is us trying to explain to Jean what, what the load case might be. And you, you really could uh, climb up it like this. But we thought, we thought maybe four people was standing on it. You know, this is like late night bad behavior at London Bridge Station. Don't get any ideas. Um, and then one of them is hung from the shard and the other sits in the public realm. This is us doing the modeling. And that, so that's the one that's hung. So this, this is the, the shard. And this figure sort of knees drawn up and is kind of looking down at the other one um, in the public realm. 
right on top of that Joiner Street link that I told you about, where the, where, which leads into the Jubilee Line. Not many people know that, actually, but you do now. So this is the one that goes into the ground. Uh, and this, uh, so this is Jean Plenza, and this is James Seller, um, who is the developer, uh, the son of Irvine, the developer of the Shard, and who we're working with now at uh, Paddington and Liverpool Street. Um, and I think, you know, that's, it's a very wonderful addition to, to the area. Now, um, that, that, uh, I'm going to, that's a nicer picture, isn't it? Um, so that's the end of my talk, but I've just got four little, um, things that you, I, I thought I might conclude. Um, I, I hope I've demonstrated that property value with infrastructure is possible. I think that is um, uh, a, very, a very real objective uh, for, for all, all of us. I know I've demonstrated it's also very challenging, digging up roads, working with underground stuff. I know that many of those constraints are not there quite to the same extent here, but uh, there will always be constraints. Um, I think you'll need a great engineer to deal with it all. I just laid that out there. But I think, finally, um, there'll be lasting uh, benefits for all of us to share. Uh, so th those were my four uh, sort of concluding points. But I was uh, interested that only this week uh, there was an item in the Times about um, Norman Foster's um, retrospective, which is at the Pompidou in Paris. Um, it's perhaps a nice thing to go and see. And the quote uh, in the paper from Norman being interviewed was this. Um, the older I get, the more I realize it's not about the building, but about the city. Now, our... Uh, um, I think he, I, you know, that that's what he's said. I I think if you, a couple of thoughts went through my mind when I saw that. In terms of Norman, if you think about the Gherkin in London, which he he designed, I think that did start the the city cluster. You know, that came, that came 20 years after La Défense in Paris and, you know, other places were kind of getting ahead. And suddenly London was on the map again as a place that was changing. And really that, that started off the city tower cluster. And whether you like it or not, the city, you know, the city of London has done, has done extremely well. Um, and it also reminded me of a quote from early Shard days that I think Richard Rogers, now sadly passed away, said, and he said, uh, the Shard had the, you know, giving permission, planning permission for the Shard would have the ability to stop London from becoming a museum. And I think what that meant was, you know, it shows again, another 20 years later, that a, a city can change and develop and progress and be, be refreshed. And I think if, Sometimes, you know, in, a, in other towns and cities, and I don't know about here, but I think, I think uh, building buildings with infrastructure can be a signal of, of change and prosperity and, um, you know, w willingness to uh, perhaps stick your neck out, uh, spend some money um, for longer term benefit. And I think if I've conveyed any of that today, um, I'm be pleased, but I'll leave you with those um, final thoughts. So thank, thank you very much. Bill, thank you. You've taken us, I think, on a really elegant journey from some diz dizzyingly large scale projects <laughs> right down to the minutiae of what the smaller scale sculptural mm. projects that were on the last slide. Uh, and folks, Bill's very kindly offered to answer any questions. 
And part of what we're trying to do, as well as film these talks, is to really encourage a general discussion around the public realm, uh, the built environment, and so on. So please, please do ask questions. Thank you, Bill. Pleasure. I didn't say I would answer any question, right? <laughs> I will have a go, though. Do we have a...? Well, I, I oh, here we go, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Um, you, you talk, describe about engineering challenges and physical challenges and things. A lot of what seems to be difficult in projects, large or small, is ownership. And it was quite interesting, the discussions around Liverpool Street and managing those. How, how do you find that they play into the planning process in, in its sort of larger sense? Um, I, in that Liverpool's uh, case, um, Network Rail are now a joint signatory to the planning application. That was a relatively late in the day decision, but I think fantastically powerful statement of, of their desire to have this work done, this, these improvements made. Um, I think if you, if you just think for a second about that rail overbuild story at the beginning, uh, I would definitely have developers come to me and say, Bill, I found this piece of track, right? I think we, it's, it doesn't look, doesn't look too complicated. Why don't we build a deck over it and build homes, offices, something or other? And I look at it and I say, uh, yeah, I, I think I tend to agree with you. That's, that's fine. I say, you do realize what's going to happen though, don't you? We're going to come up with an idea. We're going to go to Network Rail or TFL or the, the stakeholder, and we're going to say, we'd like to do this. And they're going to say, well, Bill, that is a great idea. Of course, now we need to go to the market because that is a public asset. They cannot simply, you can't say, well, I've done my appraisal and I'll give you three million quid for it. That, that is not a thing. And then the minute the developer hears that he's in a competition, you know, interest gone. So what I have looked for since uh, is where a developer has adjacency. So you can imagine uh, somebody has a, a supermarket or an office, a, a, a de, you know, decrepit residential next to a, a rail, rail tracks or um, a road or something. And then you're in a position to say, well, I can, I can maximize the value of this whole site. And by the way, I'm, I'm the only person that can do that because I own this. Now, what, what I think Seller have done so elegantly at Liverpool Street <coughs> is, to, is to do a deal where they will own that. They, they, they don't have to right now. So I think that's a, it's a very creative uh, way of, of taking that step. But just the act of saying to Network Rail, I've done it. You know, you say to them, uh, we could build X over your tracks. That they, they, they want to procure it. Now, it's sort of fair enough in the, in, I know you don't really have a train, but the, you know, we own, we own that bit of land in a way. It's public property. We, we would not want to feel that they were selling off the family silver, silver to uh, you know, to invest the developer without due process. So I think it has caused me to think, you know, that art and creativity. It, 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 I mean, it doesn't keep me awake, but you know what I mean. It sort of is a, it is a thing to think about because that is a way of unlocking the deal. It, the, the, the stakeholder by arms length investing assets to get back. Value well, the, the times that Network Rail TFL are most interested and enthusiastic is when they're getting benefit. So things like step-free access, a new station, escalators, you know, the leaking roof gets rebuilt. Things like that uh, are, are more persuasive for them. But I th their, their door is open. If you, if you have a supermarket and a piece of track here, and it's a, it's a good piece of not too difficult track and it's quite wide, I think they would, they would still happily talk to you. Yes. Yeah. The question about uh, approximately what percentage of the total build cost is a part of public realm versus the not public realm, do you think? 
Well, um, I think in the public realm, in, in the press about the Liverpool Street planning application, so it's published, I think the developers said they're spending 450 million pounds on station improvements and the, develop, the value of the whole development is 1.5 billion. Now that is a massive percentage. That's not like half a percent for public art or something. That, that is serious money in that case. Now, I, I think it's a very interesting question because I, I think it's often not that much. Um, and I don't actually know, at Paddington, uh, I'm not sure what the answer is for the, the, you know, all the tube work of the ticket hall and the step free access. But these are not, um, it's not sort of levied the other, that way around. It's, it's a kind of, I, I don't know, um, I, I, actually another way to think of this, maybe, this commercial question, on the Paddington site, where we've just put 400,000 feet of offices, 70,000 feet, and done all that work, the, there was a planning permission achieved by Fletcher Priest Architects about 15 years ago, which had 110,000 feet of office and resi, and not much else. And it had to safeguard an area in case TfL ever got the money to sort out the Bakerloo line. Now, I think you might be able to argue that because of the extent of investment in the Bakerloo line, or you know, the public realm, you have been able to quadruple the built area uh, to 400,000 feet. Now, it's not for me to say whether developers and buildings should generate sufficient cash to pay for, you know, the tube improvements, but that is what's that is what's happened there, uh, and I, I, you know, the, I think you you're moving from, uh, I don't know, design through what the, the, the heritage, the, where, how the building sits in the landscape, blah blah blah, through the planning process and then to the political process, and about what what a place needs, and I think that is, uh, well, as you all well know, that is a complex area uh, with a lot of governance and kind of checks and balances on it. Um, but I know that we, you know, I've, I'm, I'm the person that sits in the meetings with all those stakeholders and explains how we're going to do it and why we, why we need, why we want to do it. But I definitely, you know, I'm merely, you know, a, a technical advisor on the client side and everybody knows that. What I think I bring to it and which is something that you might feel is that I'm, I think I'm quite good at explaining it, to communicating about what, what this stuff is and how, how it's going to be done. And I, I, I enjoy it, obviously, but I think it, people, you know, quite a few people in my position who could do the job but can't really explain it. And, and so I know, I know all those people in, in London, GLA and the planners and so on. And, and I feel like I've got to, you know, they, I suppose they, they might slightly trust me, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Only slightly. And just on that, so Jenny, you, you've, you've taken us through sort of huge city scale projects. And obviously there are a lot of constraints, there are a lot of obstacles. And, you know, to compare it to St Helier in particular, we're smaller scale, but we have similar ob obstacles, sticking trees in, Streets is mm. difficult because perception is always services. Putting cycle lanes and pedestrian routes through town is always a good reason to say no. And I just wondered, in your experience, what sort of people and what sort of uh, catalysts have existed that have allowed the projects you've shown to, to have a someone say yes, that we might perhaps benefit from in terms of getting on with things here in Jersey? Um, I think... Uh, if you if you look at the shard, there were things um, down there which were so obviously poor and dysfunctional that it that it was um, it was sort of not too difficult to explain why uh, it, it could be so so much better. I think 
in all of these projects, I've, I've dug up an awful lot of roads and services and moved things. And I, I think, I, I mean, as a business, I, I feel I can, I can turn around to us and we can cope with any, any of that. It's not, I, I, I don't personally do that, but I think I can give a confidence that we're going to be able to, to do it. And it's not just going to run into a, even the rail stuff, it's not just going to run into a place where we say, oh, yeah, well, we thought it was a good idea, but it turns out we can't do it. I, I'm never going to, we're never going to say that. Um, I, I do think the, the, relate, the other aspect is the relationship piece. And certainly Network Rail TFL, there are, there's a whole raft of people to do, that are to do with assurance and process and governance. And... I know that if, if, you, if you don't get into them at the right level, uh, where the, the higher aspiration is uh, sort of communicated, then it's, it, it is quite easy to run into you know, some people that you know, may not have done it before, don't think you're really going to do it, seem, you know, and don't want to really engage with it. So I think, I think the relationship uh, and the, being part of the journey uh, it is important, and it's not just me. You know, there's there would be uh, the architect, the developers are very good uh, at beginning to get people lined up, and, they, and they're quite they're quite um, from time to time they're quite I wouldn't say pushy, but they're quite um, quite firm about things. I, I think. I think you know sometimes you have a, a seesaw and you know you're thinking well which way is this going to go they are determined about things and they they make sure it goes the right way and in in the I I and sometimes I think all right okay they've really said that now okay um but it's you know it's worked out it's been the right thing to do to be um to be strong and you know to to stick with it and also I mean, I mean, I don't have an insight into this either, but the, uh, if you think about this question here about how much money got, got spent, uh, there's the, the value of a planning, you know, this, I can see how the, the, this would not really perhaps work here so well. But in London, you know, creating AAA quality office space on a transport hub in the middle of London has massive value and yes you can you you know i i think at the beginning of that central line step free access i might have said to the developer um that's going to be really expensive it's quite hard to do let's do we and they said yep we're doing it now that was they didn't you know it's not as though they went to the qs and said uh bill says this might be very expensive what do you think? <laughs> Because they politically, that that was so important to to continue the dialogue, and I I think if if honestly if they'd gone to TfL and said um, that's a bit difficult, you've not achieved it for thirty years, we're not going to do it either. The temperature of that conversation would have diminished considerably. So I think I think their their, their, their judgment, and you know maybe mine isn't, but. Some some people can judge where you know that sort of cost value thing from a strategic point of view, and maybe there isn't enough of that uh, in, in those in those relationships. Well, I think from the point of view, if, you, if the cost of a lift gets you an enormous office space, you know, it's, a, it's a good deal, isn't it? Yes, yes, but, yeah. <laughs> but but remember that even that lift is is only a, a fraction on the top of everything else. I mean, there's there's you know, that might be, I, don't, I, I haven't even seen it, but it could be 30 million quid or something. But it, on top of the 400, it's like, well, what's another 30 million quid? Yes. I sit in government, and uh, one of the areas I sit on is a, a thing called Future Places. And right now we have, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with St. Helier, but the Port Regent, which sits up on top there. And this is, it's currently being emptied out by government, and there's huge criticism of, you know, what are you going to do, government? You know, there's 
all this acreage of green space, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what you talk about here is commercial value. You know, these are people with an appetite going, we're going to add huge amounts of value. We have a scenario in this place where we know the right thing to do is to try and build connectivity up there, but the thing which holds it all back is, do you know how much risk it is to government? How much, you know, can we really, we can't afford it. There's no investment cycle. There's, you know, no business case to be had, et cetera, et cetera. And I find like you sort of feel like every kind of withdrawals from this, like yeah. all these problems, it's too difficult to, to resolve. What, what could catalyze doing something in, in this sort of public realm, this, this, this environment where risk overtakes reward? There's no sense of re reward at the end of the day. Although there would be a big social reward yeah. if it were more practical. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, M Mike and I this morning went uh, looked at the harbour and, and that area, and I, I do I know a little bit about the the Fort Regent thing. I mean, I I think I, I think projects uh, a bit like the Quasette, it it, it it needs to be a big a, a big picture thing. I think I think just trying to do one thing at, at Fort Regent would not be enough. I think there would need to be a way to get there. There would need to be you know sort of uh, joint things. I mean, it's a rather, rather good site, probably for a fairly lovely hotel, maybe or something, some anchor thing that causes. Uh, now, whether that would require you to have a long lease or sell a piece of land, you know, that's that would be a big government conversation. Um, I, I mean, I don't know the, the, the probably other things about. You know, population growth and you know long long term future and so on. I may you know you you could think about your uh, demographic and the nature of what goes up. This this is quite a special place because of its kind of you know relative wealth and uh, uh, range of you know stuff you do. This is this is not an ordinary town, is it? <laughs> no, but we don't we don't have. The same thing that my colleague was talking about, Fort Region. We don't have the turnover that central London no. over a, no. a tube hub no. of having offices. Yeah. Yeah. So even even for for the hotel, which was one of the, th the first things that we thought. So all all the public realm and all the connections that everyone thought about is is actually the appetite of mm. getting the the turnover for that land that we need for everything else. I mean, I'm, I'm sure your thinking is, uh, you know, massively further advanced than anything I can conjure up on the spot. But um, uh, it's if there's a moment of inspiration here, which I'm <laughs> slightly <laughs> opposite, or somebody says we haven't thought of that. <laughs> I think it's why the, um, you mentioned earlier on that, yeah. that one of the catalysts for things being so bad. In parts of the city. <laughs> yeah. We don't have that in Cincinnati. Nothing's so bad, everything's actually not perfect, but mm. quite good. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, the difficulty of kind of using something being totally substandard as a spring point is more challenging. Yeah, yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can see that. And I, you know, in my work in London, you know, you're usually, certainly in central London, you're doing with some pretty I mean, I have referred to kebabs. I don't know if previous speakers have talked about kebabs and umbrellas, but uh, th that's, uh, I mean, you, you know, you could say south of the river around London Bridge Station was always a pretty grotty place. I, actually, I'll tell you a, a, a cracking last story about that. I was, I was once with Irvine Seller. We came uh, to, um, we arrived, for some reason I was with him in a taxi, it was really rare, it must have been like only twice I ever did that. Grumpy, grumpy fellow. Uh, and um, we was in this little queue and there was a taxi dro dropping, uh, another taxi dropping somebody off and he was complaining that he couldn't get, actually no, we were in his car, that's right. He, he I, His driver was driving him and me there. So uh, great, great big Mercedes, taxi dropping somebody off. And he was beginning to get agitated and grumpy about this. And he said, right, Bill, see that taxi driver there? He was dropping somebody at the Shard. He said, that taxi driver should be giving me half of that fare. Because if it wasn't for me, he wouldn't even be here. <laughs>
And that was, and so that was, I think that was his idea of social value, you know. <laughs> Um, just to say welcome to Jersey yeah. again and thank you for a terrific speech and thank you for everybody for coming, really appreciate it. Um, our next talk is on the 20th of July on a Thursday. It's at the Town Hall. It's Christoph Egray from Studio Egray West and he's going to be talking about rootedness. So, you know, again, getting down into the ground, context and so on. And, you know, please do come to that. Encourage your friends and colleagues to come. And thank you again. Thank you.